Firstly, thanks for uh, being here on a Sunday morning, uh, especially those who were in the bar last night. So the reason I'm giving this talk is sort of, well, two, well, three motivating factors. One is that I really like metal, you might have guessed that. Uh, the second one is that I, 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 one of the things I enjoy about getting a new data set is actually taking what, can, what is essentially a bunch of random data and trying to make sense of it, contextualize it, and put it together and form a story around it. So this idea of exploratory data analysis. One of the things you'll notice from my talk is I have absolutely no goal in mind. Uh, I'm not trying to train a classifier. I'm not trying to predict anything. I'm not trying to rank anything. I'm just taking a bunch of data and trying to make sense of it. And the final thing I'm going to be emphasizing during this talk is that actually you should probably try something simple first. If you've been looking at the program for this conference, one of the things you'll probably notice is that about a quarter of the talks name deep learning in their title. More of them mention it during the actual talk. And I mean, the reason is that if you want state of the art results, that's where to go. But often you don't need state of the art results. Often, and training these systems can take weeks, especially if you're running it on an old laptop. I mean, I'm gonna, at the end of this talk, I'm going to show you a language generation model I trained for about 40 hours on the laptop. Even more work went into getting it to uh, run it in the first place, stabilize, converge. Everything else in this talk took about an afternoon of work. There are standard libraries based around it. Everything worked nicely. And as you'll see, the results aren't that different. So if you're trying to do something simple, start with the simplest thing. And when you're using computers, the simplest thing you can do is start to count things. And that's going to be the theme of this talk, as you'll see. So this talk's based around two blog posts I've written. You can find them here. Um, basically heavy metal and natural language processing. The slides are also online, and so is all the code used to um, create all the images, diagrams, and text you see in this report. You can find online here. I'll be providing a link to these slides so you can check everything out there. So the overview is going to be what is why do we use counting why is why is sort of quantifying natural language difficult how can we approach it using counting how can we then extend these ideas towards comparing documents so the first thing we want to do is take a document turn it into some sort of vector how do we then compare them and then how do we take this further and actually generate natural language from a bunch of pre-tamed documents in an unsupervised way before that a preliminary a lot of people have opinions about what should be considered metal and what shouldn't be considered metal. Um, I'm not going to get into that debate. For the sake of this talk, everything that I have in my data set is metal, and I'm going to refer to it as such. That's uh, simply to keep things short because, well, there are subgenres and there are subgenres, but uh, I'll leave that debate till afterwards. The data set itself came from the website darklyrics.com, which is a, just a lyric site centered around uh, heavy metal. I scraped it all. It came, in the end, it came to about 200,000 songs, of which about 100, 110,000 were English. What you find is there are a lot of songs that switch between languages as well, so that's something we'll encounter later on. Um, I have no intention of releasing the lyrics, one, because people could easily then just clone Dark Lyrics' website. I mean, I've, a, I've sent an email to the, to the website admin asking if, they, if he would consider releasing this. Never had a response. The other reason I don't plan to release it is copyright. I don't own the copyright to any of these songs, and there may be issues around that. So I'm sorry if you were hoping to get a nice data, data set of metal lyrics. If you want to get your own, then it's an excellent way to learn how to scrape the web. So on the show. So the, the question is, natural language is essentially a sequence of characters. These characters form words, these words form sentences, these sentences form paragraph, choruses, verses, documents, albums, bands. It's a hierarchical structure. Everything varies in length. Um, but as uh, 
And this makes it difficult to say anything quantitative about it in the usual way when we think about machine learning and statistics. Machine learning and statistics are really good at taking an input vector, comparing input vectors, summarizing input vectors, um, comparing, classifying, all of this. There's an incredibly powerful set of tools built up around that. So how, how do we take natural language, specifically the lyrics of songs, and turn it into a vector? There are lots of ways, there's no single way, and often the way you choose to do that will depend on what document, what you're actually trying to achieve. I uh, got the screen size wrong, clearly. But the, what, 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 we, what I'm showing here is a graph of one particular attempt of doing this. On the x-axis, we have uh, readability. So this is defined, um, defined as uh, the ratio of syllables in the words to the length of the document. More syllables per word, High, lower, so higher the reading level, um, less syllables, lower the reading level. On the, on the, on the y-axis, we have the fraction of words which are swear words. And here, swear words, I've defined them as anything, doc, anything Google refuses to autocomplete. <laughs> and straight away, you can see there's actually quite a nice correlation between reading, reading um, age and uh, swear words. If you swear more, maybe swearing polysyllabically, you have a higher reading age. Um, because of the question everyone always asks, the band who swears the most is Five Finger Death Punch. I mean, they come in at just over one swear word every 20 words, which is quite good. <laughs> the band of the highest reading age in this set is uh, Pig Destroyer, who have a sort of fairly non standard um, structure in how they sing. Uh, they don't have this sort of verse chorus verse chorus structure and yeah I don't know what else to say about that uh, what I'm trying to do here is show 120 different band labels on one graph as a result it looks like a horrible mess there are better ways to view this if you leave the, the data set is online so you can look at it and explore it to your heart's content so this is this is one one way of turning natural language into a vector it's it's very specific though if you don't care about swear words it's not obvious how you would generalize this and what you would go we maybe we want to think about how we would make this a more general perp and immediately when you start to do it you run into problems the problems are is that the order of words is incredibly important the classic example in journalism is that Dog bites man isn't news, but man bites dog is news. Uh, there's also the fact that context, adding a few words here and there in a sentence can completely change the meaning of a word, the meaning of a sentence. And there's also the fact that there are lots of words. Often these words are rare. They form a power law distribution. There are a few very common words, but lots and lots of very rare words. So. With these, it's, it's not immediately obvious how to form this vector that you want to represent the document with. And the solution we're going to apply and the classic solution to this problem is to ignore it all and just count words. And yeah, this is more or less the summary of my talk and see, to see how far we can get this. This is known as the bag of words approach. What it means is you take a, take, take a bunch of documents, count how many times each word appears in that document. Your vector describing that document is then just a vector of word frequencies, maybe with some weightings. So what does metal look like? Metal looks like this. This is, so I've done some stop word removal, but other than that, I've just counted the, all the words in my corpus, plotted them, size of the word is related to the frequency of occurrence. And if we look at it, we can see, see a few things. We can see that Will, life, now, these are fairly common words in, every, in everyday language, but you see dead, pain, die, death, blood, they appear quite a lot as well, maybe more than we'd expect. And from this we're starting to get a feel for what, what maybe the major themes in heavy metal might be. And this makes sense to us because if you're an English speaker, you have some, you've read English documents before, you have some implicit understanding of how frequently a word should appear in the English language. And this is quite a nice idea, can we make it explicit? And the way we make this explicit and for a computer to understand is we take a standard English text, for the sake here I've taken the brown corpus, 
which is a standard um, set of documents, uh, newspaper articles, uh, things like that. Uh, and I've counted the frequency of words occurring in there. I've done exactly the same for my metal corpus. I've taken words that occur in both of them more than five times for each. And I've defined the metric, which I'm going to call metalness. And it's simply the, the logarithm or the ratio of the frequency of the word in the metal corpus to the frequency of the word in the English corpus. And I haven't found any name for a good unit for this yet. If you have a good name, let me know. I'm still looking. But with this, we can we can find out what are the most metal words in the English language. And burn comes number one, cries, vain, eternity, breathe, beast, gunner, demons, ashes, soul. It's, it, it's what you'd expect. These are, if, if, you, if you know metal, then yeah, this, this kind of makes sense. Uh, it's worth pointing out that things like swear words don't appear because they don't appear in the brown corpus originally. These are only words that would appear in the newspaper. And in exactly the same way, we can define least metal words. Log metal. Log metal. <laughs> I like it. And in exactly the same way, we can define the least metal words. So particularly indicated, secretary, university, relatively, approximately in chairman. Um, what, what, what's most amazing about this is these actually appear at least five times in metal, uh, in, in, in metal lyrics. Um, Yeah, um, so th th there there are a number of things you can do with this approach. So one, this, this this is one of this is kind of sort of related to taking a word and assigning a score to it. It's a, it's a common common theme in uh, sentiment analysis. There are some very simple sentiment analyzers which assign word scores, whether they're happy or sad, and then can use that to sort of plot. Uh, there's a really nice paper on how you plot emotional arcs of stories and look at how. The over, over say the course of a book, the emotional arc changes, and we we can do exactly the same with metal. We have a list of words. We have a metalness, so we can we we now have a two dimensional axis, and we can see. Oh, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself, it, because everyone always asks this. These are this is the most metal lyric I can find in my uh, in my corpus, and Infinite Darkness by Tormentor. Uh, it's more or less what you expect. You take a bunch of metal words and you repeat them over and over again. Turns out it's really metal. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> I, I, I didn't remove them. They removed them. These are the... <laughs> yeah. No verbs. No verbs. No verbs, are me verbs aren't metal. <laughs> Okay, so yeah, get, getting back to sentiment analysis and metal analysis, what, what you, what, one of the nice things you can do here is we now have a two-dimensional space where we can plot out how things change. So this is, uh, these are a bunch of Metallica albums, and we can see sort of how they've changed over their career. So you start down at the bottom with Kill 'Em All, you know, pretty damn metal. Um, pretty dark, and then they, they, they go straight away to their darkest, most metal album, Ride the Lightning, which is what you expect. And then after that, you see they're on an arc where they start getting happier. They start getting less metal, in fact. Ma uh, Master of Puppets, Justin for All, Black Album. And they sort of, that's, that's their most happy album. And then since then, they've tried to be work their way back down the sort of metal unhappy space to try and reclaim some, some of their former glory, maybe. Um, all the way to Definitely Magnetic. I haven't checked out that new album for metalness yet. It'd be interesting to see where it lands. But uh, there's nothing specifically that ties this to metal lyrics. We can do exactly the same plot for, say, uh, Harry Potter. <laughs> and, yeah, it's, the, it's exactly the same thing. Starts really happy. Um, Harry's a wizard. He's happy. He finds out he's a wizard. Um, then things get less happy and less metal because angst isn't metal for some reason. And then things, things get happier, happier, and then it starts getting darker, darker until you've got the Deathly Hallows, which is officially the most metal Harry Potter book. There's a shape who won the bit. Excuse me? There's a shape who won the bit. I sort of get the feeling you're trying to find the wand in there rather than there actually being a wand in there. 
But I'll, I'll leave, leave the interpretation entirely to you. So, yeah, now, now we have a way of turning documents into vectors. Can we use this as a way to compare documents? And the natural way is to say, let's take three bands and count the words and see what happens. So these, these bands are motorhead, machine head, and diamond head. You can maybe, maybe see a theme going in, the, in metal band names here. And it's, if you know the bands, you might be able to guess it, but you're seeing a lot of uh, C. Turns out quite a lot. But C appears just because it's a common word in the English language and not in my set of stop words. relatively to the others? Well, uh, you've almost predicted my next slide. <laughs> uh, so we, we don't want to do it on metalness because, what it, because the metalness was trained on these bands. And turns out most of the words they use are metal. What we actually care about is how they are relative to each other. So what, what word appears in each band which doesn't appear in other bands? There, there are the labels, if you were wondering. And yeah, so I, uh, how do we identify important words? And we define an important word as something which occurs more in one band than in other bands. And quite a nice model for this is treating it as a binomial distribution. So let's say you're sampling one word from each band. What is the probability that you see that word more frequently than expected? And this is quantifying the log likelihood ratio, or which is used for G test, if any. Anyone here is a statistics fan, but what it does is it just takes the number of times a word appears in one document compared to what you would expect if you combined all three documents together. And suddenly things make a lot more sense. If you don't know any of these bands, this won't make sense, but uh, yeah. If you do, then yeah, you can easily, you can see why these words are picked. You can see that for Motorhead, actually, what defines them most is the style. They've uh, sort of gone and ain't. That's the way they sing. Machine Head are all about the pain inside. And uh, <laughs> Diamond Head, oh yeah, love. <laughs> and yeah, that matches up with exactly what you'd expect. Um... We can do something exactly the same. So we've taken sort of 120 of the most common bands, the one we used for swear words originally. We've uh, look. We can we can apply get a uh, vector term frequency inverse document frequency, which is almost the same as log likelihood, um, but it's implemented in Scikit-Learn, so it's faster. And we can create vectors. These are sort of 10,000. Um, these are vectors of 10,000 units, which correspond to a sort of waiting between how often a word occurs in each document with how rare that word is in the entire corpus of metal. To get a feeling for what, what this is doing, this is Motorhead's Orgasmatron. Uh, I've highlighted all the words which make up part of the vector. So you can see that... Uh, <coughs> so pain is highlighted, but it's a fairly light colour. The darker the colour, the more important the word is in terms of inverse document frequency weighting. Pain is a light color, so it, it occurs. We, we, that means it occurs fairly commonly throughout the um, total corpus. But pain is actually repeated several times in this particular lyric, so the overall weighting of the orgasmatron vector is high in pain, um, and it's also high in uh, sadistic. Uh, but that's because sadistic is a rarer word than pain, and it only but it only occurs once. Um, Something nice about describing the pain vector. Don't know why. It's not what I expected to be doing on stage ever, but here we are. Uh, once we have these vectors, we can define. So we have vectors relating to every single song. We can also define vectors relating to a band simply by taking the mean of all the songs they produce. And with this, we can define a similarity. So how close they are, but just cosine similarity. We can do the same. So we start with a band, Motorhead. We can find nearby bands, Alice Cooper and Halloween, nearby songs, and what words define the band the most. So again, we see Don't Know Ain't, Slayer, Death, Blood, Life, unsurprising, and Carcass, Flesh, Pus, Septic, which uh, <laughs> if, you, if, you, if, you, if you know the bands makes perfect sense, which is nice because we, we haven't encoded any information about what 
these bands sing about or what metal it's uh, simply by counting words and taking some frequencies the computer's completely inferred what's going on and what makes these bands who they are and what style they have can you see this oh, you can't see it so now we have a bunch of vectors we can cluster them we can say okay which which bands appear close to each other you can't read this so it doesn't make any sense so i'm just gonna tell you it actually works pretty well so we've got a Over here, we've got a nice little power metal cluster. We've got uh, we've got things like uh, Rainbow and Dio appearing next to each other, which makes sense. You've got some a thrash metal cluster over here, a bit of black metal over here, and yeah. So we've we've no we've no uh, no definition of genre at all encoded in it. Somehow, just by taking these vectors, clustering them in a hierarchical way, we have some understanding of subgenres basically. And before going on, I should say where this fails. So the, the major limitation of this approach is that the vectors are sparse. And they're sparse because words, there are lots of words and you can't include all of the words. I've taken a thousand, sorry, 10,000 words for these vectors. And because of the sparsity, you can't do nice sort of uh, semantic uh, arithmetic like you can with word to vec and things like that. But as a first approach to uh, cl classify jobs genres, this works amazingly well and really easy to do. But there are much more sophisticated approaches. So uh, LSA, LDA, word to vec or deep whatever. I don't know what the most um, up-to-date is. It seems to change every month. I'll let you do the research. And another nice thing we can do to this corpus <laughs> is look at generating um, language itself or generating metal lyrics and if you think about how you might sit down to write lyrics you'd start with an idea you wish to communicate a story a concept something like that you you describe this you, but you'd also try and impose the constraints that come with writing a song and sort of iterate between these two ideas of communication and style until you had a document you considered good uh, we can think about how we might want to try and teach a computer to do this, but uh, I have no idea what a high level representation of an idea or a concept would even begin to look like. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ignore all that and just count things. <laughs> and the way we do this is we make the <laughs> assumption that language isn't, isn't a tool of communication at all. It's a probability distribution over a bunch of tokens. Tokens in this case can be characters or they can be words. Just some probability distribution, describe it, sample from it. That's how we're going to generate um, language. There are problems in this. It's uh, <clears throat> If you have, say, if you're doing characters, you might have 40 tokens. If you look, if you have, um, say, 100 um, character long string, then that's um, 40 to 100 possible combinations that you'd have to give a probability distribution <coughs> for. So we have to be a bit clever about how we parameterize things, but uh, that's easy. We can do that. We use Bayes' theorem. And the idea here is that if we, we decompose a sequence of tokens as the probability of the last token given all preceding tokens and then just keep decomposing it until we've got a nice representation like this even this is too uh too long for what we're doing so we're going to make another approximation and that's a mark of approximation that history doesn't matter beyond a few characters we don't care um and how do we then estimate these probabilities? We use counting again. So if we have, um, if we have a free, say, a free word context in our Markov state, what we're going to do is we're going to count how often does this, these three characters occur. So this is a two-character state. So we look at what's the probability of getting word n given word n minus 1 and n minus 2. And we're going to define it simply as number of times n, n minus 1, and n minus 2 occur divided by the number of times n minus 1 and n minus 2 occur. <coughs> now, if you're building sort of language models or anything more complicated with this, you're going to worry about what happens if this doesn't actually occur in your training data. You'll assign probability zero, and that might worry you. But uh, we're not making a language model. We're just generating and sampling from a probability distribution. So we're just going to stick to raw counts because it's easy. 
And what this looks like is a graph. From each state, you move to another state. And this is, this is the first verse of uh, Iron Maiden, uh, Number of the Beast. And if you want to generate lyrics from it, we just start here and we, we step through each state. So that's what I saw in my warped. And you, you keep going, you create, create this graph. Each, each transition has weights and we sample through it. So this is, a, this, this is the result of a four word um, context uh, Markov model. I've colored it in terms of how often a, a continuous block of text occurs in the training text. So if you, if you, if you use too short a context, it has a habit of just blindly repeating your lyrics. So yeah, it actually works surprisingly well. I, one of the things I've been meaning to do is create an online quiz where we show this to people and show them actual metal lyrics and see if they can work out which one, but I haven't got around to it yet. And yeah, this is really good. I mean, we can compare it to um, a recurrent neural net, which I trained for 40 hours um, based on a single character representation. And it's, it's better, it, re it repeats itself less. But it's not that much better. Given the amount of computational power that was thrown at this compared to the Markov model, I put the code together for the Markov model in half an hour, works beautifully. This took a lot of work to get working. Anyway, I'll leave it there. I'll leave, I'll have all the models are online. So if you want to play with them, generate your own text, please have a go. But uh, that's me. And I'll end you with... Uh, a quote I found, uh, that, well, the only quote I could find that included Python. I think it might be quite fitting for this, uh, this audience. Formulas to stop your heart and eradicate your soul. I will raise you from the ground, strengthened by the Pythonic God. <laughs> <coughs> Thank you.